Kalimera Sanchea Valenzuelanos. Kalimera Sanchea is good morning in ancient Greek. We are on the second quarter, week one of physical science. I am Julian M. Sarmiento, your Daskalos Sinanchea for the day for the topics ancient astronomy and astronomical phenomena before the advent of telescope. With the following essential learning competencies. First, Explain how the Greeks knew that the Earth is spherical. Second, cite astronomical phenomena known to astronomers before the advent of telescope. For our first activity, we will have Rebus Pazen. Here is the instruction. Use pictures, symbols, and positioning of words to decipher the hidden words or phrases. You will be given 5 seconds to give your answer. I will be your human timer. Write your answer on the, hum on the comment box below. Okay, so are you excited? Let us begin. Here is the first puzzle. What do you think is the word? Timer starts now. Time is up, and the answer is astronomy. The second puzzle. What is the word? Your timer starts now. Time is up, and the answer is Greek. Here comes the third puzzle. What is the word? Your timer starts now. Time is up. And the answer is spherical earth. The fourth puzzle. What do you think is the word? Your timer starts now. Time is up, and the answer is North Star. And the last one. What do you think is the word? Your timer starts now. Time is up, and the answer is Eclipse. Good job. So it was in Greece where the golden age of astronomy was centered. Greeks were very much noted not only as great philosophers as they used their philosophical arguments to explain the natural phenomenon around them, but as observers, great scientists, and mathematicians as well. As scientists and as mathematicians, they were able to measure the sizes and distances of the sun and moon using the basics of geometry and trigonometry. So we will have an another activity entitled Who's Who? In this activity, guess the name of Greek astronomers that will be provided. Again, I will be your human timer. You will be given five seconds to provide your answer. Comment it on the comment box. Let us start. The first Greek astronomer. Here are the choices. Your timer starts now. Time is up. And the answer is Pythagoras. The next astronomer. Here are the choices. Your timer starts now. Time is up. And the answer is Anaxagoras, the third astronomer. Here are your choices. 
Your timer starts now. And the time is up. And the answer is Aristotle. The fourth astronomer. Here are your choices. And the timer starts now. Time is up, and the answer is Eratosthenes, the fifth astronomer. Here are your choices, and timer starts now. Time is up, and the answer is Eudoxus. Last but not the least, we have here are your choices, and timer starts now. Time is up, and the answer is Claudius Ptolemy. You did a great job, students. Bravo! How did the ancient Greeks prove that the earth was round over 2,000 years ago? Early Greeks had a geocentric view of the Earth, which for them is the center of the universe. The sun, moon, and other planets orbited Earth. They also believed that stars traveled daily around the Earth. However, they all stayed in a transparent, hollow sphere called celestial sphere. Pythagoras believe that the earth was round. This was together with his pupils where they proposed a spherical earth. Because around 500 BC, most Greeks believed that the earth was round, not flat. He believed that circles and spheres to be perfect forms and suggested that the earth should be therefore a sphere. In 500 to 430 BC, Anaxagoras further supported Pythagoras' proposal through his observations of the shadows that the Earth cast on the Moon during lunar eclipse. Around 340 BC, another student of Plato, who happens to be the tutor of Alexander the Great and considered to be the greatest general authority in antiquity, named Aristotle, he listed several arguments for spherical Earth which included the positions of the North Star, the shape of the Moon and the Sun, and the disappearance of sheep when they sail over the horizon. According to Aristotle, the North Star was believed to be at a fixed point in the sky. However, when the Greeks traveled to places near the equator like Egypt, they noticed that the North Star is closer to the horizon. Aristotle also argued that if the moon and the sun were spherical, perhaps the earth was also spherical. The third argument presented by Aristotle was, if the earth was flat, then a ship traveling away from an observer becomes smaller and smaller until it disappeared. However, the Greeks observed that the ship became smaller and then its hull or the body disappeared first before the sail as if it were being enveloped by the water until it completely disappeared. The next Greek astronomer, we have Eratosthenes. The Greeks not only knew Earth was round, but also they were able to measure its size. The fairly accurate determination of Earth's diameter was made in about 200 BCE by Eratosthenes, a Greek living in Alexandria, Egypt. His method was geometric one based on the observation of the sun. 
So in this illustration, Eratosthenes measured the size of the Earth by observing the angle at which the sun rays hit our planet's surface. The sun rays comes in parallel form. But because Earth's surface curves, a ray at Zion becomes straight down, whereas the ray at Alexandria makes an angle of 7.2 degree with the vertical. That means, in effect, that at Alexandria, Earth's surface has curved away from Zion by 7.2 degree of 360 degree or 1 out of 50th of a full circle. Thus, the distance between the two cities must be 1 out of 50th of the circumference of the Earth. Now, Eratosthenes were able to measure the circumference of the Earth measuring 250 stadia. Stadium is a Greek area unit of length meaning from the race track in a stadium. So our understanding of heavenly bodies can be credited to the following astronomers. We have Anaxagoras, wherein he was able to explain the causes of the phases of the moon. Next, we have Eudoxus, which happens to be a pupil of Plato, who elaborated a geocentric model composed of crystalline spheres incorporating the platonic idea of uniform circular motion. Eudoxus was able to provide a model of the universe composed of a system of 27 spheres. First, we have one for the fixed star, three each of the sun and the moon, and four each of the planets. And what are those planets? We have Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and of course, we have our own. Next, we have Aristotle. Aristotle was a student of Plato. So Aristotle believed that the Earth is very tall in shape. It always casts a curved shadow when it eclipses the moon. He proposed that the Earth was the center of the universe. The planets are, and stars were concentric crystalline spheres centered on each Earth. So here is the illustration of the Aristotle's universe. So looking at here, the Earth is at the center, fixed and at, not moving at the center as if it was too big to move during rotation. All spheres were in uniform circular motion. The next astronomer we have, Aristarchus of Samu. He is the very first Greek to profess the heliocentric view. Helios meaning sun, centric means center. So here is the model of Aristarchus being the sun as at the center and revolving around the sun, we have the different planets. The next one we have Hipparchus. Hipparchus is considered as the greatest astronomer of the classical period. He discovered the precision of equinoxes, developed the system of stellar magnitude or the brightness of the star, and introduced the Babylonian angular notation of 300 degrees degree in a circuit. So here is the image of a precision. Precision is the westward movement of the planet. The next one, we have Claudius Ptolemy. So here is Claudius Ptolemy. He elaborated Hipparchus' geocentric system. So geocentric meaning the Earth is at the center. So he believed that the planets move in a complicated system of circuit. So he has a model known as the Ptolemaic system. So he is a Greek, a Greek astronomer and geographer at the late classical age, based at Alexandria, a colonial post of the Roman Empire. 
So here is the model of Claudius Ptolemy. The earth is at the center. So here is an illustration of the retrograde motion which Claudius Ptolemy believed the movement of the planets. Okay? So retrograde is the westward drift of the planets. You have here the small circles wherein the planets orbited known as epicycles and the larger one we have the different so this is just an introduction to astronomy before we i proceed what is astronomy astronomy is the branch of physical science dealing with heavenly bodies so we have here the astronomical phenomena before the advent of telescope. So what are those observations? Rising and setting of the sun in the east and the west. Point where the sun rises and sets in the horizon varies in the year. Phases of the moon, lunar eclipse, solar eclipse, the daily and annual motion of the stars. We have here Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So these are all the planets discovered before the telescope. The first one we have, the rising and setting of the sun in the east and west. Babylonian and Egyptian civilization used a primitive version of a sundial known as nomon in systematically observing the motion of the stars. By looking at the shadow, that the gnomon cast, they were able to observe that the sun rises in the eastern part of the sky, reaches its highest points in the midday, and sets in the western part of the sky. The next one we have, the point where right sun rises and sets in the horizon varies in a year. So as you can see in the illustration, we have here different seasons. Okay, so during winter and fall, the sun rises in the southeast, while sunset at the southwest. However, during spring and summer, the sun rises in the northeast and sunset in the northwest. They observed that these variations are related to weather and so concluded that seasonal changes in the climate happened during a course of one year. Earth's axis is also not perpendicular to the plane of its orbit. Instead, the Earth is tilted on its axis approximately 23.4 degrees. This is what gives us our seasons here on Earth. When the North Pole is tilted toward the Sun, the Northern Hemisphere experiences summer while the sun is at the high highest point in the sky at noon during winter the north pole is tilted away from the sun and at the noon the sun doesn't get nearly as high in the sky earth's tilt also explains why the longest day of the year occurs on the summer solstice usually around june 21 likewise the shortest day of the year occurs on the winter solstice, usually around December 21. The combination of Earth's elliptical orbit and the tilt of its axis results in the sun taking different paths across the sky at slightly different speeds each day. This gives us different sunrise and sunset times each day. The next observation we have the phases of moon. There are eight phases within about a month. The time interval between a full or new moon and the next repetition of the same phase as a nodic month averages about 29.53 days. Therefore, in those lunar calendars in which each month begins on the day of the new moon, the full moon falls on either the 40th or the 50th day of the lunar month. The next observation is during lunar eclipse. 
always remember this mnemonic device for lunar eclipse. S, E, M, or SEM. The sun, the earth, and the moon. So, lunar eclipse is the lining of the earth, moon, and sun producing when the moon passes into the shadow of the earth. Usually, a lunar eclipse either precedes or follows a solar eclipse by two weeks. Just as all solar eclipses involves a new moon, all lunar eclipses involve a full moon. A lunar eclipse may be partial or total. All observers on the dark side of the Earth see a lunar eclipse at the same time. Interestingly, when the moon is fully eclipsed, it is well visible and reddish. The next one we have the solar eclipse. Remember this mnemonic device. S-M-E The sun, the moon, and the earth. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon's shadow falls on the earth. Because of the large size of the sun, rays of sunlight taper to provide an umbra or a total shadow and a surrounding penumbra or a partial shadow. An observer in the umbra part of the shadow experiences darkness during the day of a total eclipse, totality. Totality begins when the sun disappears behind the moon and ends when the sun appears on the other edge of the moon. The average time of totality is 2 to 3 minutes and a maximum of 7.5 minutes. The next observation, we have daily or diurnal motion of the stars. It refers to the apparent movement of stars in other celestial bodies around the Earth. The circular path that the celestial bodies take to complete the diurnal motion is called diurnal circle. Next observation, the annual motion of the stars. Annual motion is the apparent yearly movement of the stars as observed from the Earth as a direct effect of the Earth's revolution or the movement of the Earth around the sun for every year. This happens during annual motion, we could see different constellations at different months or different periods of the year. Next, we have precision of equinoxes. This is the apparent motion of the equinoxes along the ecliptic as Earth wobbles, and this motion happens every 26,000 years. Yes, you heard it right. At present, our North Pole or the North Star, we have Polaris. But after 26,000 years, Polaris will not anymore be the North Star. It will be now pointing to Vega, the star Vega. Yes. So after 26 years from Polaris, our North Star would be Vega. The next one, we have the different planets discovered before the advent of telescopes. We have Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So the first planet that we have is Mercury. The smallest and the fastest. One revolution is 88 days. For one day, it would take 1,407 hours or 58 Earth days, it have either a very thin atmosphere or none at all. Mariner 10 was the first space uh, satellite or expedition that ever landed to Mercury. It was named after the Roman god of messenger. We have here Venus. It is the hottest planet. Why? Because all the atmosphere of, the, of Venus contains carbon dioxide. It is considered to be the morning or evening star. Why morning? Because during sunset, you can see this star visibly or this moon visibly. And during, or rather sunrise, during sunset, you can see Venus as the evening star. One Venus day is equivalent to 243 Earth days. 
and it rotates clockwise on its axis. It is considered to be the twin sister of the earth. Named after the Roman god of beauty, Venus. We have here Mars. It is home for the largest volcano in the solar system, known as Olympus Mons. One year in Mars is equivalent to 685.98 days compared to Earth. It has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. It has half of the day Earth's diameter and less than the density of the Earth. It is considered to be the reddish planet. The next one we have here, Jupiter. It is considered to be a Jovian planet. The volume is 1,300 times that of the Earth. One revolution would take 11.78 years before it could orbit the Sun. Rotation happens by 9 hours and 55 minutes. It has more than 60 moons. The next one we have Saturn. So we all know the visible feature of Saturn, we have its rings. It is noted for its famous rings. One year is equivalent to 29.5 years on Earth, the lowest density of all the planets. Why? Just like the planet Jupiter, Saturn has the lightest elements in the universe, hydrogen and helium. The volume is 755 times greater than the Earth. Approximately, it has 82 moons. Okay, we are done now with our discussion. I will be waiting for your questions. So this is our question and answer portion. Okay, there is a question that popped up. Why do we have to study history of astronomy? Okay, thank you for that question. First, history of astronomy is fascinating. Parang love yan. Hindi mo maipaliwanag. Pero masarap sa pakiramdam. Namamahal, nasasaktan, nagmamahal ulit. Second, understand the facts of astronomy better if you know why astronomers came to believe such incredible things. Third, the history of one's controversial ideas can shed light on scientific controversies that are still alive today. Okay, so let us now proceed for our assessment. Are you ready? I will be again your human timer. So the first question. Greek philosopher who gave the most accurate size of the spherical Earth during their time around 250,000 stages. Your timer starts now. Time is up, and the answer is Eratosthenes. The second question. Which of the following is the shape of the Earth according to ancient Greeks? A. Cylinder B. Octagon C. Flat disc D. Sphere Timer starts now. Time is up and the answer is letter D. Sphere The third question. A branch of physical science dealing with heavenly bodies. Your timer starts now. Time is up and the answer is astronomy. The fourth question. Babylonian and Egyptian civilizations use a primitive version of a sundial known as or told as Blank and systematically observing the motion of the sun. Your timer starts now. Time is up and the answer is nomon. The last question. 
a planet considered to be a morning star during sunrise and an evening star during sunset. Your timer starts now. Time is up. And the answer is Venus. So congratulations. If you got it five, very good. For our assignment or intellectual exercise, you can see here a mirror. This is entitled Mirror My Greek Astronomer. If you were be given the chance to talk to a Greek astronomer, who would that be and why? You can submit your answer to the email address flashed on your screen. Again, if you were be given the chance to talk to a Greek astronomer, who would that be and why? So my email address is julie underscore 1884 at yahoo.com. So again, this is our most essential learning competencies. Explain how the Greeks knew that the Earth is spherical. Cite astronomical phenomena known to astronomers before the advent of telescope. Again, this is Julian M. Sarmiento greeting you. Merci beaucoup et bon journée.